Production funding for Making It Up North is provided by the citizens of Minnesota through the Minnesota Arts and Cultural Heritage Fund. Making it, we're all trying to make it and we all have something to learn. In this episode, you'll meet four people in the process of making it. You'll meet an artist in Duluth, a musician in Babbitt, a hat maker in Embarrass, and a coffee roaster right here in Duluth. Come along and explore the art of making it. We're at the Duluth Coffee Company, uh, getting some perspective on making it. Eric, did you have a moment where you knew the Duluth Coffee Company would make it? There was a point in time, like uh, a couple years in, you know, where I, I could tell you know, the place was so packed and full that I could tell that like we had like a new responsibility to to stay in business because we were like becoming an institution that that. It wasn't just uh, Eric's Coffee Shop, it was Duluth Coffee Company, and it was representative of everyone that was working there and everything that we were creating every day. I roasted with Eric for probably a, a year or so. I was roasting hundreds of batches, uh, maybe thousands over the course of a couple of months, you know? So, get a feel for it and how it moves and heats, and yeah, I kind of fell in love. Kind of when I saw that, like, the company moved beyond me, I knew that we had made it and had a responsibility to each other and to our customers to, to stay in business. There was no option to fail after that. You were a roaster, you were a coffee drinker. Where did this start for you? I tell people, like, Duluth Coffee Company has always, like, been in my heart since as long as I can remember. My brother and I went to coffee shops at an early age and I always loved it. I got an espresso machine when I was in high school and was that weird kid making espresso before he went to, you know, class. And um, I started working in a coffee shop in high school and then in college I started to mess around with a roasting coffee and a popcorn popper in my dorm room and I studied English for some odd reason. Probably most likely because I liked reading books in coffee shops and I was always meant to just do coffee and do it on my own. So take me through doing it on your own and then opening a storefront. That's a big commitment. Yeah, it, it is. Like, it started small. Um, I got my first real small commercial loan. I put a lien against anything that I owned, put a, a commercial roaster in my garage slash shed and started selling coffee out of the back of an old pickup truck I had at a uh, the farmer's market and, and people started to find out about me and I quit my regular job in uh, April of 2012 and uh, I've just never looked back. It's been uh, the greatest time of my life. You call that making it. <laughs> yeah. The leap anyway. Exactly, I guess, yeah. Make it? I don't know, have I made it? I don't, is that a thing? <laughs> I didn't know that was a thing. <laughs> You are listening to 94.5 WELY, Northern Minnesota's classic rock at the end of the road. If you're just joining us, this is the Afternoon Delight Drive Home Show. First thing I do when I get here is I replace a whole bunch of songs <laughs> and, I, and I play songs that I like. And here is Queen, 94.5 WELY, Northern Minnesota's classic rock at the end of the road. Can you believe they pay me to do this? This is fun. Fun stuff. All right, we can head out.
Hello. Are you helping? Are you helping? Safety first. Yeah, this is the family house. Um, we've had since, uh, it's been in the family since the 1950s. That was my grandma's room, grandma and grandpa's room. That, this was their bedroom. I did this to it. <laughs> you know, I leave everything mic'd up at all times, so I just turn on the recording system and I'm recording. It just never ends. That's, that's <laughs> doesn't really have a beginning, it just doesn't stop. That's the whole thing. Oh, the writing process is, um, well, it usually starts on a couch. <laughs> usually this one. Um, I don't subscribe to the, you've got to be inspired to write anymore. I used to, um, but then there would be these dead spots where I wouldn't write, you know, and I just kind of got used to putting it into my just daily routine. Each day I, I sit down after everybody goes to bed, after the dogs have eaten and everything's calm and settled down, I usually turn on my Xbox or a movie or something and then just pick up where I'd left off the night before. It doesn't really stop. And so then what I'll do is uh, I'll start to get ideas for the melodies and stuff. Throughout the days that I'm working on it, I, I'll have my eyes open everywhere I'm at for some topic, something. I mean, what am I gonna sing about? Just like starlight licking on a desert sky, the moon looking down with its big old eye, staring at the place where we used to park. We get out of the car and we yell at the sky. You tell jokes and I tell lies. We'd have a few drinks, watch the satellites blink overhead and fly right by, getting lost in the stars like Christmas lights. Can't remember every single thing I said, but I remember that feeling till the day I'm dead. All right. That fits into like the storyteller type songs where I'll have an idea, uh, you know, of a story or I'll start writing it on paper. Not I, this won't even be involved. It'll it'll just be kind of like a rhythmic um, vocal thing. I could use a change of clothes, a shower, comb my hair. There's a love ride on the dance floor. Man, I do declare. Life is short on his little stone, make the most of it, I swear now, come on. I got the syntax for the first verse, and that kind of laid kind of a template for the, the three following verses. Um, the chorus has a little bit of melody in it. Be kind of that sing-along thing. And, and So that's really the only part of the song that even has a like a definite like song, sing-songy melody. The rest of it is just a giant tongue twister. Uh. <laughs> and everybody's running around so pressed for time fast like a rabbit on a power line. Down a deep hole, find a place to hide and you're watching the world through cold Wi-Fi. And if I can make one simple request. Sometimes it's easy for an artist to scrutinize and you know, I want to be deep and I want to be complicated. Um, and sometimes you just have to put that, that pride or that ego aside and just be like, no, it's okay. It's okay to write the simple song. And it's a long way to home from here and I feel a little worse for wear. A lot of times it's those familiar things that make it approachable, you know, for an audience. Um, and that's another part of this is, is once you get it done, and you, everybody learns it, then you bring it out, then it really comes down to, to people, whether they get up and dance to it or, or whether they sing along to it. If I see them mouthing the words to it, if I could tell they like it, it's probably gonna stick and stay and get recorded. If it doesn't, it just kick it to the curb and move on to the next one. Life is <laughs> on his little stone, make the most of it, I swear now come on. Being a, a working musician or artist, I uh, I think takes the tentacle approach to, I mean, if you get into the finance part of it. Play shows, sell merchandise, give lessons, find uh, a day job that is in your field, um, in your interest area. I work at the radio station, it's something that I'm interested in. So not one of them makes a, a whole lot of money. 
together they make it so you can afford to live and do what you want to do just like you know my dad told me and probably a lot of people's dads do something that you love so that it doesn't feel like you're doing work hours of this <laughs> hours <laughs> Duluth coffee has to start with beans, right? How do you know you have good beans? Knowing that you have good beans is, is about like uh, knowing like the story of each bean and for us just knowing like uh, where it came from and which hands have touched it before it's arrived to us. So for us it just starts by um, working through our importer and working all the way back uh, on every single coffee and year after year as you like taste coffees, they build a history in you. So you begin to learn farms and you begin to learn regions and, and every year when, when crops arise out of different countries like Kenya or Costa Rica, we already kind of know where to go to and then we're just continually fine-tuning what we're looking for from specific countries. How do you decide which batch you're gonna buy? We're able to, to see the quality of a, a green coffee. Green coffee is like the seed of a coffee cherry and so we're able to get information from exporters and importers about the quality of the green bean and then after we receive that green bean um, we roast it to to what we feel is going to be like the ideal taste for that coffee and then adjust it from there and we adjust it based on how it tastes and so uh, we go through a ritual called cupping and cupping is essentially just mixing water and coffee grounds and just trying to get an impression of the coffee without any influence of any brewing method. And so we take a small dish like this, we grind up a small amount of coffee, we smell the dry aromas, then we'll pour like water on it. We'll let it steep, then we'll smell the wet aromas and then we'll just take spoons and just slurp the coffee, swish it around in our mouth, chew on it, take in the impression of it, and then decide if this is what we're looking for in that coffee or what qualities or attributes that we can taste that we want to bring out more. How long did it take to educate and develop that palate to, to say, this is, this is the flavor I'm looking for? It's, I'm still working on it. It's something that we, we practice ritually uh, as often as we can. Uh, it took a long time to become discerning because in coffee it's, it takes a lot of humility to just say like uh, I don't always know what this tastes like and just allow yourself to keep practicing and pressing into it and finally like building an understanding of, of your own taste buds and being able to connect your tongue with your mind and then like vocalize that. Sounds like a lot of work. It is, it's a lot of fun. <laughs> Everybody says, oh, I'm not a hat person, or I don't wear hats, or I don't look good in hats, and I think everybody feels that way, but once you try them on, they're amazing, and they're one of a kind, handcrafted. So, yeah, they're gorgeous. I mean, you can't go wrong with any of them, truly. People are just so much fun at an art show. This one's speaking to me today. <laughs> I make a living making hats, and people will say to me repeatedly, well, I wish hats would come back, and I go, well, where did they go? They never went anywhere, did they? So I don't need, you know, an audience of millions. I just need my loyal customers and new customers, and, and I'm happy I can make a living. My name is Patty Bird. I consider myself a fiber artist because I work entirely with fibers, but I'm also a milliner, and I live in Embarrass, Minnesota. Over the years, since I've been doing this for 40-some years, making hats or things out of something, I've devised 
a quicker method of making a hat. I don't even know what I know anymore. It's not a conscious thing and I'll just know intuitively what to do and my hands keep working. You know, and the other thing about it is I'm doing this and a lot of it is something I've done many times before, but I do not get tired of it. People say, well, don't you just fall asleep at your sewing machine? I'm like, no, because it is my passion. I have, I have five packages of fabric in my car from the other day, and I will be like a kid at Christmas opening those bags and I'll go, oh my God, and I'll be throwing everything together and seeing what works and it'll be so exciting because this is my inspiration. And then sometimes the things on the shelves get new life when I bring new stuff in. And then I go, oh, this goes with that. As a matter of fact, this came off my shelf. I didn't buy this the other day, but it's gonna look really nice on there. People say to me, well, how long does it take you to make a hat? And I say 40 years. You know, if someone new started out this morning to make this hat, it would take them probably three days. <laughs> so it's, it's not fair for them to ask me that really, because I sit here and work at it over and over and over until I get really good at it. And this is just a little test to see how big I want it to be. So yeah, um, I say 40 years. People will say to me so often, well, but if I wear a hat, everyone will look at me. I go, yeah, and that's bad because sometimes it'll be the first time hat wearer I walk away from my booth, come back an hour later and said, three people stopped me and told me how nice I looked. And I'm like, there you have it. I'd wear any of these. You know, I'd wear this. And some people just like a little throw on, go to the store hat like this. You know, this hat is for people who are afraid to mix any color. These are very light cotton on top, so you'd be very cool in the summer and get a good sunshade. You know, if you're in the sun, you want it like this because you want the shade, but if you, know, you want to be adorable, then you do that. And here's for winter hats good warm hats. Come down plenty far if you need to, you know, because we live in Minnesota, let's face it. I don't formally size anything. I just sit here and make some bigger and some smaller and use my own head as kind of my medium. And voila, the hat is born. You know, they're meant to go have a life out in the world. And I'll get excited by the next thing I do. I like for people to be encompassed in it, to walk up and feel like they really are in that environment, in that piece. So my stuff is not intimate and little, it's kind of big and bold. Beautiful. You know what it is. Well, we support each other. It feels good. I mean, that's what I do. It helps create the culture of this city where, you know, and there's a lot of it. My name is Kirsten Ani. I'm an artist, a textile artist. Um, and I live in Duluth, Minnesota. I noticed that you're using a lot of these. Well, it takes a lot of work. It takes a lot of work. It takes a lot of grant writing. It takes connections of knowing people here and there. Um, support. I have really great family support. My sister's amazing. She really supports me. It just reminds me the simplicity and the geometry of Finland and the modern shape, shapes it makes. Okay, this will probably come off a little bit. 
pretty. Nature is pretty symmetrical. There's patterns, in a way. Leaves, mirrored images. I'm doing that show at the Nordic Center, and it's our um, inspirations from our trip to Finland. Mm -hmm. So I have to do a piece also with big flowers because of Mari Meko. And I've done other flower pieces in the past, even though most of my work is geometric. Um, it's fun to do some flowers. I wanted kind of violets and greens and black, and I always love orange. It's fun. Hey, here we go. You know, people love patterns. I love patterns. So I'll put some more black in here. Maybe, yeah, I think I'm going to do a big black here. I was going to do one of just circles inside circles with triangles and just have a whole black and white. And I'm still intending to do that. But right when I have, I start working, before I know it, I'm throwing in other colors and patterns that I wasn't even meaning to do. <laughs> I used to call it kind of a visual Tourette's. I like for everything to kind of relate. So when you're looking at it, it's like, oh, it kind of visually repeats and makes, you know, visual sense. I want to get back into lampshades and pillows and things for the house, furnishings, and um, clothes. Yeah, it's fun. This one is actually, the black is screen printed. This is Red Wing Blackbird. And the wings and the eyes and the um, beak I all hand stenciled. So I have to make a bunch of stencils. I do this wing, this wing, this wing, this wing on my big table over there, then come back with the other wing. It took a while, but because I don't have a system for really lining up colors yet with the repeats. And um, these are more. They all these go with the wall hangings, some quilts that I made. So they were hung up. So there's kind of a visual dance going on with people wearing the clothes and the quilt, and kind of make an environment. And then my fish. Well, it's definitely uh, a Scandinavian feeling, you know, which is something that we're really interested in. Clean lines, really clean everything, but with pops of color or design. People love it. Yeah. People are always coming up and then they're like, you did it? I think the atmosphere and, and the decor of the restaurant really plays into service and our interactions with our customers because it gives you so many talking points when people come in right off the bat they want to know about you know this piece or that piece um, we think it contributed to a really unique space and a really beautiful one and one that has really strong connections to our community it makes a strong city a strong country strong people to have that connection to art So tell me about the footprint of Duluth Coffee today. What all are you doing? When we opened, we opened in October of 2012, and it was just the coffee shop. But when we opened that coffee shop, we were a roastery first, a wholesale roasting company. That's what we wanted to be. The coffee shop was like auxiliary. And over the last five years, it's become like a community hub. It's become, you know, more of a coffee shop than a roastery. And over the past year, we've been going through an expansion. We took over the shop two doors down on the corner. We took over the whole upstairs. And we've tried to remember and redefine ourselves as a roasting company first that operates a fantastic coffee shop. And so this place here, 101, is uh, our future roastery, or what we call the roasteria. And in this place, we're going to put a large coffee roaster, 70 kilo coffee roaster, which is much larger than what we have now. And this is where we're going to do most of our production roasting and also kind of showcase that we are a roasting company and a wholesaler. And so in this space, we've added uh, a retail component, which is this uh, bar, because uh, we believe that coffee is, is crafted and has a lot of synergy with other 
beverages that are crafted. And so we want to showcase wines and beers and spirits that are crafted by other local purveyors that we respect and look up to. And we also want to, in this space, we want to cultivate conversations about coffee and the perception of taste. It, there, there's a, an atmosphere, a feeling when you come in that there is a community of people that's built up around your business. Yeah, definitely. Like uh, our coffee shop feels like cheers some mornings where all the regulars are there and everybody knows each other's names. And it's just, uh, it's such a, it's a place that's, that's beyond even all of us that work here. Like it's owned by the community at this point. And it's, I, I love it because on weekends like Grandma's Marathon, um, it's still happening. All the regulars are in there and it's loud and excited. And people from out of town come in and they just watch it like a show going on of all the interactions between employees and customers and uh, it's fun. It's, uh, it's an extremely fun place, an energetic space and a place with just a lot of energy every single day. Yeah. Well, congratulations for making this step. Thank you so much, yeah. Good luck. Change of clothes, a shower on my head. But there's a love right on the dance floor. Man, I do declare. Life is short on this little stone. Make the most of it, I swear. Now, come on.